Welcome to part two of the PDP-1173 Barn Find Rescue. Now that my workbench is clear, it's time to remove the computer from the floor stand. Altogether, this machine weighs about 75 pounds, so it's quite a beast to move around. The first step is to slide the computer itself out of the stand. The computer is housed in a chassis referred to as a BA-23. It's a 19 inch rack mount chassis that can be installed into a floor stand like it is here or installed into a server rack. The BA-23 includes the peripherals and the front panel. Let's take a look at that. That's the sled unlock, that's the drive unlock, but this, this won't release. So we'll try to figure out what's up with that. We are missing some other pieces up here. That's okay though. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this BA23 chassis can actually mount just like this, uh, which is a normal 19 inch rack size. Uh, so this little sign, a little trick here, can actually rotate. Ta -da! Pretty cool. But first thing we need to do is we need to open up that power supply and make sure there's nothing horrible in it. These systems are designed to be modular. They're meant to be repaired in the field by technicians dispatched by deck to go into server rooms and do the repairs on the componentry. As such, everything within the chassis can easily be unscrewed and removed and gives easy access to all the pieces. Here I'm removing all the screws that are holding down the power supply and removing the service panel to access the connectors on the front of the power supply. The power supply proved to be a little trickier to remove than I thought. Mostly it was just a matter of finding all the connectors and figuring out where they went. The white cable goes to the front panel for the power switch, the black cable goes to the cooling fans, and the flat white cables on the top are the feed to the Q bus and the peripherals. Considering the age of the power supply, it's in really good condition. No cobwebs or massive layers of dust. So we'll do a quick air clean out just to get some of the excess dust out of the way before we power it up. Time to reinstall the power supply. Getting it to fit in the chassis was a bit of a challenge. It was quite a snug fit, but once it dropped into place, there was no problem. I reconnected the power feeds to the Q bus into the peripherals and screwed everything back together. The next thing I want to do is run through all the equipment that's installed into this machine. This 11 has a breakout panel on the back that is set up to drive up to 13 terminals. Removing a card from a Q-Bus backplane is a matter of manipulating the levers at the top of the card, which help push the card out of the socket. This board is referred to as a KDJ11B. It's the main CPU board for a PDP-1173. It carries the J11 CPU chips, as well as all the supporting hardware for driving the rest of the system. This next board is an M7551 memory card. This is the main memory for the system and carries 512 kilobytes of RAM. For 1986, when this machine was manufactured, that was a staggering amount of memory. At this point, I made a very disappointing discovery. One of the ribbon cables that connects the DLV11J serial line cards to the back panel had been cut. This happens on occasion when people are disassembling and working on systems and they don't need the cables anymore. They'll just take a pair of scissors and cut them in half. It's really disappointing and very disheartening to see it. For this project, it won't really impact what I'm trying to do, but it was quite sad to see this type of damage.
speaking of DLV11Js, let's take a look at them. There are two of them inside this machine, each managing four serial ports. They're actually not very intelligent cards. They just have a UART for each of the serial ports, plus the communication hardware necessary to talk on the bus. Taking them out requires a little bit of wiggling because they are half width cards and only have two tabs into the backplane. So a little wiggling and they'll pop right out. The next card is a DHV11J card. This is an eight line serial MUX board and is much better at handling high speed serial terminals than the DLV11Js are. It has a lot more buffering capability and is quite a bit smarter. The next two cards serve as the controller subsystem that manages the storage devices that are stored in the front of the chassis. The first is an RQDX3 controller. This card connects up to the hard disk, which is an RD53. RD53 drives are basically 72 meg full height hard drives. The second board is a TKQ50, which serves as the controller for the TK50 tape drive, which is a DLT drive. After a quick blowout with my canned air, which coincidentally used up the last of that can, it was time to put things back together. Reassembly of the chassis is very simple. It's just a matter of putting the cards back in and making sure they get seated into the back plane nice and securely. The guides on either side of the cage help enormously to make sure that the cards go in straight. The full width boards that use four slots on the back plane have small metal levers that will actually push the card into the slot for you. So all you need to do is line up the little pins and then push the levers down and it'll push the card directly into the slot. I reconnected the control cable and the console cable to the breakout panel. And from here on, we're ready to start powering this machine up. That's the console port right there. And the spiffy thing is it's got a little spinny selector here. You can actually see a little five in there that says we are currently set to 1200 baud. Woohoo! That's that's screaming. Not okay, but the advantage is that's a DB25 RS232 port. So really, all we need to do is get ourselves a terminal to attach to that, and we should be able to power this up. All right, about ready for the next step here. So what I've done is I pulled out my uh, my trusty little Linux laptop here. That's our console port. Just a note, I probably I need to isolate that because that card is sitting, uh, this uh, breakout panel is sitting right on the chassis and we don't want that. So let's see, put something in the way. That we're gonna use a Serial adapter here. This is a USB to serial port in there. There we go. And in theory, hurrah! This tells us we have a USB 2.3 and TTY USB 0. That's good. The next step, of course, is that's a 9-pin connector. That's a 25-pin connector. Fortunately, we have adapters. This is a 9-pin gender changer, which I need to go to that guy. In theory, we should be able to just do that. And that's our connection. Let's patch that guy in. Lines up correctly. Pins all look okay. There we go. Now, TTY USB 0, I have to do is go screen dev TTY USB. And we saw from that switch it's at 1200 baud. So, here's our terminal session. It's getting exciting now. We're ready to try this.
hear the hard drive spinning up. Can a console message B2? Probably a post error. The wonderful manual directions here say consult the manual for the B2 error. I'm, that B2 error. might be a red herring because I didn't get anything on the console here I'm suspecting we might need a null modem here it so happens I have a null modem cable null modem adapter this is a uh, so there's null modem on it let's plug this into the chain and see what we get Ah, hello there. Error 62M8190 CPU cache error. Nice. M8190 CPU cache error. Let's that test. All right. This is good. This means the bootstrap is giving me an error. That's fine. To start. All right, on to debug this. I'll be back. So, small update. Um, on the CPU, I dug around and found some very old manuals, and this switch pack here uh, helps the boot ROM, such as it is, determine how to boot. And two, three, and four here designate the boot device and what pro basically what program to run when it powers up. But boot five here tells the diagnostic tells the console whether it should try to boot basically. Theoretically if I switch that off I should get a different boot experience. Let's try it. So I'm gonna reach around the front here. Give it another power up. Like that. There we go. Alright. Not a lot of difference. Those switches didn't do anything, so I decided to try to use the halt button on the front panel to see if I could get into the monitor. Unfortunately, Though I was able to get into the monitor, I really didn't know what to do with it. The next thing I found is that during the boot sequence, if you hit Control C a bunch of times, you can get into a boot menu. This was actually a bit of a step forward as now I could select devices to boot from and whatever. To make a long story short, nothing worked. I tried booting the internal disk which was mapped as DU0 and got a controller error. No matter what happened, I was constantly getting the cache error from the CPU board. I slowly came to the conclusion that whether the CPU board is the actual root problem or not, I really can't make progress without repairing the CPU or replacing it. So that brings us to the end of part two of this series. I'm honestly not sure what our next steps are without a new CPU board. This project is doomed. So I stand and wait and hope that something will develop. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and would like to see more, please click the like and subscribe button down below or leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you.